we will okay we are back on <laughs> so apologies everyone for our technical difficulties but we are back on and we are ready to go with Juan Marino from Sexing Technologies so once again thank you Juan for joining us thank you everyone for being patient with our technical issues and yes we are ready to go so um, take it away Juan well, uh, sorry for the inconvenience. I'm not too good at using this laptop and these computers or Zoom for me. I think it's the second time I use it. But anyways, we'll, we'll try to move along this morning and then try to answer some of your questions that you may have. Uh, so the, the topic of the day for us is how can we use sex semen as a tool to help us deliver sustainability? we believe that there is a, a group of technologies that when put together and used uh, use as a group um, will improve our ability as dairy farmers, as livestock producers, as protein producers to feed the world in a most sustainable way. Uh, and sex semen is one of those tools that can help us deliver sustainability, but it has to work in conjunction with a number of other tools. For example, we got to have the right genetics, in this case, when it comes to production traits, to environmental traits that are a new set of traits that we traditionally have never selected for, but now with the new world, we have to select for. Sex semen is the method to deliver those genetics, but there are other technologies like robotics for milking and feeding cows, electronics to to monitor the welfare animals. And we'll talk a little bit about that during the day today. We're going into a world in which we will not be able to allow to uh, use uh, antibiotics or the, the use of antibiotics in animals will be severely restricted and controlled. For sure, we are going into a world where hormones will be severely limited as well. And then we're gonna start having a new set of technologies on farm that, that deliver what are called point of care diagnostics. As a group of those technologies is what our new world of, as producers is going to be uh, surrounded by. So our goal is to deliver technological innovation of livestock genetics and reproduction, utilizing biology and data analysis to improve efficiencies in livestock production to contribute to a sustainable world. And this last phrase is very important to us because at the end of the day as producers, in any type of any industry that anybody can be involved, the producer should always be concerned about his ultimate client and who is our ultimate client that we need to be think about, thinking about it. So what are some of the trends that will impact our future as producers to be able to make the ultimate client happy with our product. And in order to make that client happy with our product, the ultimate client, we need, we're gonna to need to use disruptive technologies that help us produce livestock in a sustainable way. Genomics is one of those technologies, sex sperm technology applied to cattle is another one, and digital electronics is a third one. So why a sustainable world? Everybody hears that phrase and we brush it aside and don't want to talk about it sometimes uh, because we feel threatened by it. But who, what are the changes that are going to be impacting our future? Whom, where, and how? So first of all, the human population of our beautiful planet Earth is quickly heading in the direction today. We got about six and a half billion people. And by 2050, the UN is estimating that we're gonna have 9 billion people. Actually, this estimation now has been increased and we're probably estimated to hit more like nine and a half to 10 billion people. So a very fast growing population that is mostly occurring, occurring in the developing world with a very stable population now in the developed world. So our product, which is milk or is the derivatives is going to be delivered mostly to the international market. Now, where is that market located? Where is our end consumer at the end located? 
So interestingly, interestingly, our end consumer is moving into heavily populated urban areas. Whether in Europe, we expect the 78% of the population to 80% 80, 80 of the population is believing in cities. In Latin America, the number will be as high as 84%. And in North America, the number is expected to be about 86%. So a very heavy concentration of our consumers, the end users of our product, whether it's milk, cheese, whey, dry powder, or any of our derivatives, or even meat, because as dairy farmers, we still produce meat as a byproduct of our production system. So those end users will be in heavily populated areas. A lot of them would have lived in cities for one, two, or three generations now, removed from farm production. They believe that milk comes from the refrigerator. They don't have any concept of what it takes to produce protein. However, they got some expectations. And because they're the buyers of our product and the ones paying for our product, we are going to have to deliver in those expectations. And those expectations is to, for us to produce the pro the, our products in a sustainable manner. The United Nations, the World Bank, and a lot of world organizations have a multitude of publications. This is one, is one that is very interesting in that sometimes when you read a publication like this, you may feel threatened by it, but the reality is they, could, they can be our friends instead of our contenders or our enemies. If we put a little bit of attention as to just some of the things that they're saying. So some of the things that they're saying, for example, are highlighted in this page from that publication. And if we look down here at the bottom, there is gonna be a slow rate of growth in demand for resource intensive foods as, such as beef. But the demand is quite large, so that they're referring to a demand on a per capita basis. But remember, we're going from 6 billion people to 9 billion people. So the reality is that they expect that between 2010 and 2050, 10 years already gone by, they projected the global growth in demand for animal-based food, pro based foods to increase by 68%, okay? So, and rumen and, rumen and meat is gonna increase by 88%. So we are going to have to increase our production considerably. We're already 10 years into that projection in order to feed the world. And our ultimate job as producers of livestock protein, whether it's dairy or beef, is to feed the world. One alternative that some people are pushing is to reduce the consumption of meat and dairy in diets because they're inefficient in converting feed. So this is a basic point that we gotta understand. The reason they're pushing for the reduction in the consumption is because they fear that there won't be enough milk or dairy products to feed the nine billion people but there won't be enough beef or meat to feed those people. So they're trying to push the consumption down because they think we're inefficient at producing it. So our first task should become to become efficient at producing it. And we simply have, we're gonna have to produce more without expanding the amount of land that we use to produce it. So we're just gonna simply have to produce more livestock protein on the same amount of land that we use today or with the same amount of natural resources. So in order to do that, we just simply gotta get more productive and more efficient as to how we do it. And in order to be more productive and more efficient as to how we do it, we gotta utilize all the technologies that are available to us today. Milk is one of the most nutritious products that exist in the supermarket for the consumer. Milk and all their products are full of minerals and proteins and vitamins, Carb even carbohydrates, potassium, that are essential to human subsistence. Likewise, beef is also a pro an animal a protein that contains a number of nutrients that are very good and essential to human survival and human development. So we got excellent product, but how do we do it? How do we produce this product in a more efficient way. We also gotta remember that those people who live in the city 
and they haven't been surrounded by farm production now for either one or two or three generations, have a tendency to romanticize about the past. It's how, you know, you talk about either organic feed or, you know, small farm production and so forth and so on. But remember, and in that process, they think that the way we produce today with some of these new technologies is not the right way to do it. They'd rather go to the past. But the reality is we got to use all these technologies if we're going to produce enough food to feed the 10 billion people. And not one group can do it on their own. It's going to have to be an effort of all of us as producers and all the companies that are involved in our sector. I think that we as a company here at ST Genetics at Sex and Technologies, our goal is to work with everybody and collaborate with everybody, whether it's other companies in the field, researchers in the field, and all the producers. So how do we do it? We see the genetics is the driving force to make a lot of this change. So number one, the choosing of the elite germplasm, utilizing the statistics and all the latest technologies in animal breeding. Looking at molecular biology, at looking at genetics, just not from the, from the statistical side and the, and the numbers side, but also from the molecular side. How do we utilize that knowledge to create faster, genetic progress. We got our access to computers, genetic mapping, doing assemblies that we didn't have two decades ago. But today, computing power, our ability to utilize genomics allows us to make a tremendous amount of genetic progress. We can utilize embryos through transfer, IVF, cloning, amniocentesis. Obviously, sex semen is a tool to deliver those genetics and that selection that has been done in animal breeding through molecular biology or bioinformatics. But they also not add new traits coming in, where is one that we label as ecofeed, but really essentially refer refers to feed conversion, which goes back to the concept of producing more with the same amount of available land and natural resources. We're gonna to have to utilize electronic devices and monitoring to be able to give our consumer, our end user, which is that, soup, that producer that goes, that folk that lives in the city that goes and buys from the supermarket, the confidence that we're producing our product in a sustainable way, and that we're taking care of our animals properly. So we're gonna to cover today some subjects as to whom and how, who and how and where, which we already spoke about it. So, how is all this world population going to be fed? Depending on where in the world you live as a, an end user, is the type of animal protein that you have more like for. So if you look at North America, there is a, there is a lot, the greatest consumption is in chicken, whether you call it meat or eggs. Then there is a like for the utilization of beef, a lot of milk, and then some pork. On the other side of the world, if you live move to Asia, there it chicken and eggs, meat, it's a big, big deal. It's a very heavy part of percentage of the consumption. And then the other one is pork. With milk products and a small ruminants increasing a little bit. But now if you move to countries like India, buffalo becomes a big source of animal protein. So again, depends on where in the world you live is the type of product you like. Now, if you look at the dark blue, there is a, a like in a lot of big parts of the world to utilize milk and its product as an essential source of animal protein. Now, this is another way to look at it is how that animal protein is delivered. When you look at the world semen market, you realize basically where genetic progress is occurring because of semen, right? Oddly, in India and Pakistan, it's probably the places in the world where the most semen stress are used in the world. This graph was made about five or six years ago, so it's old. The new data says it's pointing to about 100 million strokes of semen being used in that part of the world. Second biggest utilization of semen because the animal numbers, there is a relation to animal numbers, is in North America. 
there's a big increase in countries like China and other parts of Asia, China, Vietnam, and other parts. So there is utilization of genetics around the world. So genetics is spread around the world today through the utilization of semen. Now, how are we going to produce enough food in enough quantities? And this is a subject that's interesting because it is very simple to do it. It's through genetic improvement. This is a graph that shows the genetic improvement and then in the, how genetic improvement in, the, in, in uh, the production of corn improve the production of corn. So in the same number of acres or hectares, if you want to call it, corn had gone in 1938, if we use the base in the 40s, to today, we increased corn production in the same amount of land. We produce about 600% more than we used to produce. And that happened because of the utilization of genetics and fertilizer. So it is doable and it can be done. In the case of dairy, if we look at it, the graph in North America, we gone for, in 1961 from under 3,000 kilograms of milk and in lactation to by 2014 being well over 9,000 kilograms of milk and in lactation. Other parts of the world have increased their genetic production as well. So this is lactation per cow, and that increase has been to, due to genetic improvement and also through the utilization of new nutritional supplements, diets, and so forth. In the case of poultry, it's quite dramatic what genetic improvement has done over the years. If we compare, and I know it's a long time, 1925, but it used to take 112 days to feed a chick to slaughter weight. Today, it takes less than 44 days. It was 44 days in 2005. Today is really down to about 38 days. In 1925, that animal used to weigh two and a half pounds. Today it weighs five and a quarter pound. It used to take 4.7 pounds of feed to make one pound of gain. Today, a chick takes less than two pounds of feed to make a pound of gain. So again, tremendous improvement in genetics. This picture is really telling. Somebody took a set of uh, uh, poultry genetics and that was from 1957 and poultry genetics from 2001, put it in the same environment, fed them the same diet for the same number, for the same number of days. And this is what happened. This is what the carcass of the genetics of 1957 looked like as compared to the genetics of 2001. So by 85 days of feeding that, that, that poultry, Look what that carcass looked like compared to the 1957 genetics. This is more like the carcass we see in the supermarket today, but look at the comparison. So again, the total amount of muscle that was put into that animal has been increased by the use of genetics. We got to remember that there's been 50,000 generations of humankind, but there's only been one generation for modern technology. And that's the generation that we're all in today. There's only been one generation of Google. So imagine, and I use Google as a reference point because it makes you think that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we, wouldn't, we didn't even know what Google was. Today is a simple occurrence for everybody in this presentation today to use Google. So as we move forward, what genetic tools can we use? So we got an access to an incredible technology, which is called genomic testing. Technology has gone to the point where we can take a little sample of tissue from an animal in the field at a day of age, put it in a package, send it to a lab that runs it into this magic system that puts that tissue in a sequence of letters. It creates a genomic evaluation that is interpreted and then gives us back information in a very short period of time. Within two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, we have results. And we know from that animal that is now two, three weeks old, what this genetic potential is going to be for the rest of their life, allowing us to make decisions very early in life. We can also use genomic testing to predict the value of the genetics that we're using. As a result of the use of genomics, 
we can increase the genetic value in animals, whether it's beef, in the case of beef producers, you're looking at average daily gain and other traits, or fertility for both beef and dairy animals. Feed conversion, which just basically refers to the kilograms of food that you put into an animal versus the kilograms of milk that animal produces. Carcass traits, health traits, milk fat, protein traits. Genomics allows us to make a very early decision in the life of an animal as to its genetic potential. Imagine you can predict how much milk that animal is going to make in its first lactation, just when that animal is two weeks of age. And you can predict that with 80% accuracy. It is very simple. We're just simply looking at a DNA chain of those animals. Those animals in that DNA have a sequence of letters and those letters get, are, those sequences are given a certain value. And among thousands and thousands of animals, now we're able to rank those animals. And we're able to say uh, in this 200 animals that are in this picture, this animal down here in the right bottom corner is the most productive animal. 10 years ago, they were all equal to one another for us. We can utilize that technology with computers today because now we know the sequence of the female and we know the sequence of the male. So the computers actually tell us statistically which male made it to which female is more likely to make us a better generation coming up for us. In other words, you can utilize this technology to predict where our future is going to be. Why is this important? This graph comes from the Food and World or uh, Food Agriculture Organization, FAO. They estimated that in 2017, there were 274 million dairy cows around the world. That's what it took to feed 6 billion people. <clears throat> Some countries, the consumption of milk and milk products was higher than other countries, but at the levels of those consumption in 2017, it took 274 million cows. <clears throat> this is the number of cows on a per country basis. But remember the number of 274 million cows. By 2050, when we got, we're gonna have nine and a half billion people on this planet Earth. If we don't improve genetics, the genetics that we utilize today, and we keep milk production at the same average as 2017, instead of 274 million cows, we're gonna need 525 million cows. That's twice as much. And they're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to have more land. Land is one thing that is finite in this world. We can't fit 525 million cows in the amount of arable land that we have today. If those cow, if the, today's cows produce twice as, milk, as, as much milk as they produce today in the same amount of land, we're gonna need 262 million cows. So folks, if your average milk production per cow today in 2020 is, going, is about 8,000, 9,000 kilograms of milk, what I'm telling you is in order to feed the world in the next 30 years, you're gonna to have to produce 16 to 18,000 kilograms of milk per lactation per cow with the same amount of nutrients as we do today. Now we are already gone and seen that it's doable. The poultry people have done it, the pork people have done it, and we have actually done it in the dairy industry over the last 30 years. We just gotta do it once more. We are lucky that we have access to technologies like genomics to be able to help us. But if we do not utilize genomics to be able to do that selection, and we do not utilize tools like sex semen to make that selection occur at a faster pace, we're gonna be facing a pretty serious challenge. And so is the world as well. Now, I mentioned several times feed efficiency and feed conversion. The world has got one resource that is finite, is arable land and the amount of water that we have. We simply are going to have to produce more with the same amount of arable land that we utilize today. Therefore, our animals gotta become more feed efficient. Feed conversion is going to be a fundamental part of our genetic selection for the next 30 years because those folks that buy our product in the supermarkets at the cities are gonna demand us to do it. And remember, those are the people who vote 80% of 
to 88% of the votes are going to be in the city. We are in the minority as producers in the farm world. Our, yes, we do go and vote and we try to lobby our politicians to help us, but we're just going to have to adapt and accept that we're going to have to make this type of changes. So feed conversion measures how well an animal converts feed to growth and milk. And this feed conversion applies both to beef and to dairy. In the case of dairy, it applies to two points in their life. The first point is to growth, because an animal goes from one day of age to, two, to 24 months or 26, 28 months of age before it starts producing its first drop of milk. So that is called growth. Then after it starts lactating for one, two, three, or four lactations as you heard, it converts feed to milk. In order to measure those feed conversion, facilities like this is, are being developed around the world. ST has two of those facilities, one in Texas for beef cattle and another one in, in Wisconsin for dairy cattle, where we be measuring feed conversion in different breeds, both beef and dairy. And we are now measuring all as well on what we call in the United States beef and dairy, which is part of something we're gonna be talking about later on. Feed conversion is independent of a lot of other traits like milk, fat, protein, somatic cell, DPR, other traits we've been selecting for. So we're actually looking now for a specific combination of genetics that give us either a high TPI or high BPI or a high net merit or high fat or protein content, whatever it is, solids, and a very good feed conversion. So it's not that we changed our past selection, just with that we're adding one more trade to our future, because we believe firmly that those folks in the city who are our end consumers are going to be demanding us to do it. For example, we've been able to compare that the daughters out of bulls, the daughters that have bulls that are very good for feed conversion eat 13 pounds of feed per day less than the daughters of bulls that are not very good for feed conversion. So there is a significant difference. Why is the difference so large? Because we never selected for it as an industry. We're very lucky as an industry, the feed conversion is a medium heritability trait at 0.21. That means that we can make relatively fast genetic progress, okay? It's not a low heritability trait in which it will take many, many, many years to make a change. By just putting some emphasis in it, we can make a tremendous amount of change over the next 10 or 15 years and be able to accomplish the goal of producing twice the amount of milk or twice the amount of solids with the same natural resources that we're using today. As we move forward and we talk about other subjects, then we gotta think about to make that genetic improvement, reproduction is a key part of it. And what reproduction tools can we use? Clara mentioned today that we're talking about sex semen, which us as a company we're heavily involved in. Some of us, some people believe that sex semen is something new. The reality is it is not. It was first proved. It first, the first proof of concept of sex semen was by Dr. Larry Johnson at USDA more than 25 years ago. It does take technology a long time to go from the lab to the field sometimes. So it's been a slow process, but the basic technology has remained the same. And we're basically comparing the size of the X and the Y chromosome. With the Y chromosome, which is the female chromosome, being smaller than the X chromosome, the Y chromosome, I'm sorry, being larger than the X chromosome. The Y chromosome being larger than the X chromosome. There's a difference of about 3.9% in between a female, which is XY, versus a male that is XX. So we use very advanced computing systems to look at the sperm cells and measure the amount of DNA content and be able to tell whether it's a male, male or female sperm cell. Today, more than 20 million strokes of sex semen will be produced in 2020 around the world. Sex semen has been, utilization around the world has been increasing at a very fast pace, especially over the last three years as the fertility of the product has increased. This is a picture of pro at the largest sex organ lab in the world, is one that we would call a mega lab. It has 96 sorters in it. It has the capacity to produce on any given year 
at its maximum potential, about seven and a half million strokes of sex semen. Today, it's producing in a rate about four million cells, four million strokes. So the technology has advanced tremendously since 1995, where the original speeds of identifying a cell on a per second basis was 200 to 400 cells per second. At that time, we could only get about 83% of the correct sex, so about 83% females. And the fertility of sex semen compared to conventional was about 70%, so it was pretty low. This is 20 years ago. By the, the early 2000s, the source speeds had increased to about 1,000 cells per second, 85% purity, and the 80% fertility of conventional semen. About 2010, we were now sorting about 5,000 cells per second, again with about 85% female in the sample and 80% of the fertility of the conventional semen. This is really about the period of time when sex semen was initially became available in markets around the world. It was very much a niche product that was not utilized heavily because its fertility was not the highest. But in the last 15 years, Technology has improved tremendously, and I'll go a little bit over it in a few seconds. And now we're sorting at speeds higher than 10,000 cells per second. Why is that number important? Because the cost of producing the product has decreased substantially. Therefore, the price of sex semen to the end user in the field, the dairy farmer, the beef producer, has decreased significantly since 2010. In addition, Today, it's very common for the purity of the percent of females being born being higher than 93%. It is easy for us, or relatively simple, to set our production parameters where in a consistent basis you get more than 93% female. And the fertility of sex semen, which is the most exciting part, has increased substantially. When I made this slide three or four years ago, I was talking about having about 95% of the fertility of conventional semen. But that improvement of, of, occurred over 15 years of research and development. What were the improvements? There were significant improvements in the process. Just how we collected the samples from this, the, the bulls, how we processed those samples, how quickly we processed them. The equipment that we utilized, the flow cytometers or the cell selecting machines, we changed about six different models in a period of 15 years. Almost like you change your iPhone. We went from iPhone 1 to iPhone 10 during that period. There were significant improvements in the formulation of media, the production and the media, and the quality controls of those medias, and the quality controls of the end product coming out, the frozen straw. For us at ST, quality control became our most important job. And quality control involved just not only the design, the manufacturing, and the utilization of the cell sorters, which we manufacture ourselves. We own a company, it's called Cytonome, in which we develop our own technology and we produce the equipment that produces the sex semen. There are three different versions of this equipment that we utilize from a small version for small productions to some that you saw in the picture in the mega labs to the next generation of equipment that we already have in the, coming online. All the medias are produced at the highest level of quality controls. They're literally, literally produced sterile. We were the first company in the world to be utilized in sterile medias to produce semen. Nobody user, utilizes sterile media to produce conventional semen in the world. We actually manufacture those medias in clean rooms just like it is done for in human pharmaceutical use. You wouldn't think about injecting anything in your body that wasn't a sterile. Well, we thought it was important that the medias that are used to produce sex semen will be a sterile. So pretty sophisticated facilities were built in order to have those medias and a warehousing system where those medias can be stored for certain periods of time while the quality control in those medias go on. So all those medias are, are tested they got the right chemical mix in it, that they don't have any microbes, they, have, they don't have any contamination of any kind. And not only it goes through all those quality control parameters, it is utilized in the production of sex semen. 
because we made all those changes, we started to see significant increases in the fertility of sex scene. So here is a study that we run in Germany, and this study has non-return rates. And it shows that in, in the study, the non-return rates of the old way to producing sex semen are about 56%. But with the new processes, we were up in the 66% range. So we increased the, the non-return rate of sex semen because of the improvements in the technology. This year, this is data that I'm showing to you and to anybody publicly for the first time. We will be announcing shortly a further improvement in the fertility of sex semen. We have been running trials around the world in this, in this improvement. So this is a set that has about 14,000 inseminations with the new improvement as compared to 33,000 inseminations of conventional semen. It was done in 80, eight, over 80 herds and it involved over 30,000 females. And what we shows is that the conception rate between sex semen and conventional semen is basically identical. 40%, statistically, the number was identical. This is, right below is the sex semen that was, that was produced under, not the method of 20 years ago, but just the method of three years ago. We, we ran, we ran the same study in the United Kingdom. It's this data that I got about a month ago from the United Kingdom, in which we got 14,000 inseminations and we're running 40% versus 42% for conventional semen in cows and 61% versus 60% in heifers. Again, and because some of this product is getting now in the field over the last couple of years and the producers are actually seeing the results with their own eyes and feeling it every day in their farms, there's been in the, in the United States, a big new trend going on, a huge important shift in the way dairy producers. And we call it beef on dairy. And the, the trend started about 2017, 18. So this is data from NAAB as to the number of shows of semen that are sold in the United States between 2017 to 2018, and I got the data for 18 to 19 already, so I'll, it's not on the, I won't have it on the slides, but I'll mention it. But between 17 to 18, there was a decrease of almost 6% in the number of straws used in dairy cows in the United States. It was not that there was less cows, it was not that there was less AIs. There was 6% less straws of dairy semen used. We went from using 20.3, straws down to 21.8. So roughly a difference about 1.5 million straws, less dairy semen was used in the United States. Why? Because we used about one and a half million more straws of beef semen on dairy cows. So it was not that less cows got an AI, it was not that less semen got AI, it was simply that we used, instead of, of dairy conventional semen on dairy cows, the United States started using beef semen on dairy cows. A lot of producers, by 2019, by the way, that increase went from about one and a half million straws, now it's about four million straws. What is happening is, the producers are, are using genomics to identify their best females. Their best females are being artificially inseminated with sex female semen out of the best bulls. And that's what is creating the next generation of replacements. And the rest of the herd is being bred to beef bulls. So those are some of the changes that are occurring today and they're occurring at a, at a very fast pace. And those changes mean that there's a new product of meat. It's called beef on dairy. And it's showing to be a very high quality product that is starting to bring a premium. A lot of producers that are feeding now beef on dairy genetics on the feedlots are getting the same price. And in some cases, a higher price than producers are getting for a straight beef animal. Why? Because that dairy animal crossbred with the beef bull has a tremendous amount of uniformity. 
Imagine this, if I'm a large dairy and I produce 100 beef calves out of dairy cows, all those 100 beef calves are going to be out of one bull. That is called uniformity. And the beef chain likes uniformity. Now let's talk about all the technologies that can go together with genomics and sex semen that allows us to have a brighter and better future. And that's called bioelectronics. There's a bunch of devices that are coming in line that will allow us to improve our production. Some of you are already using some of them, like heat detection devices. Some of, the, of you use a heat and a neck, uh, neck device that detects the animal movement and rumination and so forth. All that data is going into computers. So all the data that is happening from those devices, whether it's a heat detection device or genomics or sex semen, is going into this famous thing that everybody calls the cloud. And the cloud magic magically takes all that data and can provide it to us as producers in our laptop or on our phone and allow us to make better and quicker decisions. We have a new device that is a bolus. We're utilizing it now in care. This, this, this pill goes into the room of the animal, it sits there, it has a battery that has a life of about 24 months, and it's taking the temperature of the animal 94 times a day. It is also recording, recording every event that happens to that animal, not just the temperature and telling the producer when the animal is getting sick, but the treatment the animal receives, what type of antibiotic, in what quantity, on what day, at what time, at what hour. It's called traceability. It is also called social responsibility. So we're now going to be able to have all the data put together to provide our end user with the confidence that we as producers are truly producing a sustainable product, that we really care about the well-being and the welfare of our animals. And that we don't just simply use words to say that we care, but that we actually can back it up with data. And that, we believe, is going to eventually lead to what we call blockchain. And that is going to be a big change in animal production and animal agriculture. It is happening today right in front of us. And a lot of us are part of it. So I want to thank you for taking your time today. Again, we believe firmly that feed conversion and feed efficiency is fundamental to our future. I want to thank Genetics Australia for this opportunity to share some of our thoughts. And I'll be glad to answer any questions that anybody may have. Claire, it's your turn. And I'll stop sharing the screen, I guess. Thank you, Juan. That was um, a tremendous insight into um, yeah everything that Sex and Technologies has, has been doing. Um, just a quick question to get the ball rolling. Um, how do you think the current pandemic of COVID-19 will affect the livestock genetic industry and will it cause us to change or a change tact or pivot? Um, at That's an interesting question. Uh, you know, people were locked up in their homes depending on part, what part of the world it occurred at for anywhere between a month and three months, right? During that time, our end consumer who lives in the city started to realize how important we are to them because they had two options, watch the TV and go to the supermarket to get their food. Food wasn't, in, suddenly it went to a new level of how essential it is in their lives. Now, through this period, what we found out is that logistics can be an impediment. In the case of what happened in the United States, for example, there were two kinds of logistics that had been um, utilized, developed over the years to deliver food. One, for example, in the kind of beef, there were different cuts of beef for the restaurant business that there was for the supermarket. So when the, super, when the restaurants were closed, there was, all that beef was sitting out there because it couldn't be utilized for the, for the supermarkets. But on the other hand, uh, the restaurants couldn't utilize it. But on the other hand, the supermarkets were short of beef. So, the same thing happened with milk because there was a lot of milk certain utilized in certain ways and cheese at super at restaurants and we had to change to a fluid delivery system in the supermarkets so we had temporary interruptions in the logistics supplies which affected the price now that we're coming out of it the price of milk in the united states is incredible for example before the pandemic 
we were getting paid about $18 for every 100 pounds of milk. The milk got as low as $11 per 100 pounds of milk during the, during the coronavirus. And yesterday it was back up to over $20 per 100 pounds. So we had a, a temporary severe drop in the price of milk and then an incredible recovery in the price of milk over the last two weeks. I think in the long term, we're gonna get back to normal. And again, the, produce, the consumers will be out there and it'll be, we're just gonna to have to produce the amount of milk that's gonna require to feed the nine billion people we're gonna have. Yeah, very true. Um, questions just come in. Um, where does ST view uh, heat tolerance? Is there any existing projects currently being worked on at the moment? So there, they, we got, we do have a project in, in a, a group of animals in which we're studying this, this slick gene. Okay. So you can, you can look at a heat tolerance in two different ways. Um, one is through the introduction of genetics. So like this slick gene that there are some claims out there that those animals are, are more heat tolerant than animals that don't carry that gene or by basically, uh, um, adapting our production systems to provide, provide more comfort for animals. Obviously, if your production is in open pastures, you might be cons more, and you're producing in areas of high heat, you're more concerned about that heat tolerance. If you are producing in enclosed environments, we can control the environment that animal in those barns today with cross ventilation, tunnel ventilation, and other systems in which we can make the life of that cow very, very comfortable. So yeah, it is one of the things that we're looking at. Are there any other um, genes or projects that you're looking at at the moment that um, you know are, are kind of exciting that that you could potentially share with us? Well, uh, obviously we we concentrate a lot on the fertility. Uh, we we concentrated quite a bit on on immune responses of animals on natural immunity because. Again, one of the things that we see common is we are going to have to be more careful about the utilization of antibiotics. Hormones are probably going to be eliminated from our systems. We are heavily involved in, in this bioinformatics and biotechnologies and, and, and uh, combining like that bolus and electronics with biology. Uh, so for example, if we are not able to utilize synchronization hormones in the future, that we can still detect heat accurately and determine the correct time of artificial insemination. Remember, if we don't get a cow pregnant, she won't make any milk. Yeah, absolutely. So everything starts with getting a cow pregnant. So anything that revolves around fertility, whether it's from the genetic side or the technology side, we're heavily involved in. Awesome. Um, another question that's popped up um, is, uh, there is always a lot of conversation around inbreeding, normally pedigree inbreeding. Um, are ST doing any research in, into genomic inbreeding and the possibility of this process being able to identify exactly which individuals in an animal's pedigree can contribute to it being an elite individual and breed leader and the possibility of a full brother being insignificant? So inbreeding is an interesting word, right? Um, by default, we have been inbreeding over decades in, in order to be able to concentrate the most favorable, favorable genes in a population. And there are two kinds of inbreeding that we can call. One is what we've been used to talking over the years, which is, it relates really what a pedigree, what, who the father and who the mother is and who the grandparents and what the relation, are you breeding first cousins to second cousins and third cousins and so forth and so on. And that's the kind of inbreeding you calculate basically based on the pedigree of an animal. With the advent of genomics, now we can calculate something that's called genomic inbreeding. I give a kind of a strange example, but I utilize my brother and myself. By the way, we've both been DNA tested and we are full siblings, okay? <laughs> I, I'm one meter and eight, 1 1.8 meters tall and I weigh 280 pounds and I got hair. My brother is 160, weighs 140 pounds and he's bald. We are full brothers. Now, what could have happened there? Why are we so different? Well, what happens is he could have gotten in the lock of the draw 
more genes from my brother, from my mother than from my father. And I could have had more genes from my father than from my mother. So when you look at us genetically, even though we are full brothers, we might be totally different genetically one from another. That's the kind of things that we can tell through genomics today. We can actually look at the genetic sequence of a cow and determine what her inbreeding coefficient is. So we have tools today that allow us to work through the inbreeding question in a much more easier way than we had 10 years ago. So I honestly speaking, I am no longer worried about inbreeding at all like I used to be 10 years ago, but under one condition, as long as you're genomically testing and as long as you're utilizing the technologies that are available, available today to measure it and utilize it in your favor. Juan, um, is the conception rate data that you presented from the UK and US, is that from synchronized matings? It's for, from a, a mix of 88, 80 some herds. So it's a, it is a mix of synchronized matings uh, because a lot of the large herds in the US, for example, utilize um, over sync or close sync, all the synchronization protocols that just synchronize all the scouts and got certain predetermined days of the week that they do their AI. To some that utilize just natural heat or heat detection devices. So there, it is a combination of all of the above. Um, has there been much of a move among dairy and beef um, breeders to use 100% sex semen in their heifers? Um, we're seeing, uh, I mean, there's always people out there that could be doing that. What we're seeing the most right now at this point in time, again, is uh, a lot of producers that are identifying their, the best 50% of their females. Those females are being, being bred with sex female semen to make the next set of, of the next generation. And the other 50% of the herd is being bet, bred to beef bulls. Now, up to this point, the beef semen is being used as being conventional semen. We are starting to see some herds to use beef male semen instead of beef conventional semen, because in the United States, there is a premium paid for the steer calf, the male calf, versus that heifer calf for that crossbred animal. Um, just on the subject of beef, um, will they be, will you be doing um, chromosomal mating for beef cattle? Yes, yeah, so future? what we're doing, for example, is we're bringing in into the testing station back uh, beef on dairy calves. So we will bring about every 90 days, we'll bring about 600 of those calves. We're actually testing average daily gain, ribeye size, marbling, and feed conversion of those animals. We're following all those animals all the way to slaughter and determining which animals are the most productive animals, the most feed efficient animals, and the ones that provide the best economic return to the farmers. So now we're gonna have data on all these beef sires as to how they behave genetically when they're using dairy cows as a crossbred animal to produce beef. So we will be able to utilize the chromosomal mating for beef bulls on dairy cows. Where does ST stand on the future of gene editing and its uses? That's a, a really interesting question. So obviously we, we believe the technology works. CRISPR is a technology that is, that is proven. Uh, it has risks. We are not, we do not believe it's gonna have any commercial utilization for the foreseeable future. I don't think that we need it at this point in time because we can do we believe that we can create enough genetic progress through the utilization of genomics, sex like semen, embryo transfer, IVF, and other technologies where we don't have to use genetic modifications. And why don't we want to use genetic modifications? Because 88% of the people live in the city. There are consumers at the end of the day. They're the ones who pay us for what we do every day. And they don't want us to use it. If you look at the, at the studies that have been done at the polls, that is simply something they don't want to happen at this point in time. Now, if the consumer changes his mind, then maybe gene editing may have a place, but we don't believe today it has a place in commercial animal production. It does have a place in science, 
Because again, we're gonna be 10 billion people in this world and we're gonna to have to feed them somehow. And if we're not able to do it through genetic improvement the way we're trying today, then we better have a backup. And maybe at that time, the public would change his mind. But I don't think in the foreseeable future, the public would change his mind. Just a few more questions, Juan. Um, and similarly, going off your previous response, um, how do we grow our production to feed the world by 2050 when most farmers are getting out of the industry because they can't make a living from it? So that is an unfortunate situation that farmers can't make a living out of it. And, and that is a, that's a good point. Um, that, that is an effect that has been occurring over the last 30 years. So I graduated from college in dairy science um, 30 years ago. And at that time, if you look at the numbers, there were 70,000 dairy farms in the United States. Uh, today, we're under 50,000 dairy farms. I think that the number for 2020 will be around 45,000 dairy farms. Okay. Um, we got less dairy cows today than we had 30 years ago. But our cows today are twice as productive as they were 30 years ago. So will there be less cows or the same number of cows today? I showed a graph that there's 274 million dairy cows in the world today to feed today's world population. And that either we're gonna to have to have 560 million dairy cows in 2050 to, milk, to feed the world population, or with the same number of cows that we have today, or even less, we're gonna to have to produce twice as much. So, yeah. At the end of the day, the reality, like in any industry, in order to stay in business, um, we are going to have to become a lot more efficient. We're going to have to produce a lot more with less. Now, one way to reduce our cost of production, therefore increase our margins and make our, our producers profitable, is feed. 65% of all expenses in a dairy are is feed. If it takes less feed to produce the same amount of milk, your cost goes down. And that might be the one way to keep more producers in business today. We have to be more efficient. There's just simply no way around it. Yeah, super interesting. There's um, just a couple more questions and, and we'll finish things up. Um, What's the number one trait that's being chased right now for dairy producers? So over the years, the traits have changed considerably um, and it's basically a direct relationship to what the market is demanding. So uh, milk pounds in, in North America were, was heavily chased for a number of years. In the last two years, solids are becoming more and more valuable. So percentage fat and percentage protein is now the new wave, I guess you're going to call it. There were other traits five or 10 years ago, like uh, fertility, uh, daughter pregnancy rate, uh, somatic cell counts that, that were in vogue or, or, or very looked after. We made tremendous genetic improvement over the last 10 years in those traits. So there is not as much emphasis today on DPR, on somatic cell counts, and on those and milk pounds as there as they used to be, and there's more emphasis on percentage fat and percentage protein and solids. Absolutely. Um, and just one to finish up. Um, I believe ST um, have worked with um, various species outside of just the livestock industry. Is there a particular species that um, that you've been working with? more recently that, you know, that it excites you or intrigues you or, um, you know, or even working with other, other different um, species like sheep or pigs or anything like that? Yeah, so, so uh, actually my last slide originally had a, 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 sorry, my last slide that I was going to have in the presentation had a picture of a sow with 18 babies on it. They're all females. So we are using sex semen in pigs today. We got two sex sorting labs producing sex semen for pigs at a nucleus herd uh, 
and uh, we're using it in one in two nucleus hertz and three multiplier hertz today. Uh, we're also doing quite a bit of sex semen now in sheep and goats, uh, and also some in horses. So we got two labs in Europe producing sex semen on horses, and we've been producing sex semen for sheep and goats in the United States in the last year. So it, it is a technology that works for mul multiple species. Fantastic. Well, we will finish things up there while I'm just um, conscious of everyone else's time. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, yeah, and jumping on board all the way from um, Texas. So yeah, we really certainly appreciate it. Um, I just want to take this moment to also um, uh, announce our guest speaker for next week is also coming from um, not too far from you, Juan. Um, our, our speaker next week will be Dr. Kai Poller, who's the Assistant Professor at Texas AM. Um, Emmy University and Kai will be discussing the topic of improving fertility and the tools and techniques um, that he has uh, researched over his time there. So super interesting. I had the pleasure of seeing um, Kai um, present at World Dairy Expo last year. And it was yeah, certainly a really, really interesting presentation. So um, I hope that all our participants can, can join in with us next week. So until then, please keep safe, everyone. Um, we will be sending this recording through to you tomorrow morning or to you, Kai, um, one this afternoon. Um, but thank you again and good night. Good night to everybody. Thank you very much.